Uh, good uh, afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure today to give you a brief uh, overview on uh, science results uh, from the first galaxies uh, team uh, in the last year uh, or so. so. Jess, I... Okay, yeah, okay. Now, with a bit of lag, apologies, uh, we can start. Um, so, the broad aim of the uh, first uh, uh, Galaxies research program is uh, fitting inside the cosmic origin problem. Uh, where are we coming from and how the universe we see today uh, uh, was uh, uh, formed? Uh, specifically inside the context of Australian astronomy, the first uh, galaxies research uh, is central to contribute answering uh, to one of the key questions of the uh, Australian Decadal Plan. How did the first stars and galaxies uh, transform the universe? And our specific uh, uh, focus uh, inside the project uh, is to try to understand whether the star formation that uh, we start to uh, spot uh, uh, at very low resolution uh, in the very distant objects, uh, such as uh, the galaxy GNZ11, uh, which is observed uh, uh, as it was at 13.4 giga years ago, an image shown on the left of this slide compares uh, to the star formation processes that we can observe with incredible detail in the local universe uh, today. And uh, um, more uh, specifically, we have three main aims uh, inside uh, the project. Uh, first, uh, we are working on the discovery, characterization, and modeling of the first light sources. Uh, combining observations from space telescopes, primarily Hubble, but also up until recently, the Spitzer Space Telescope, with the numerical and theoretical modeling uh, uh, of the formation of first uh, uh, stars and first galaxies and first quasars. Um, second aspect is to look uh, for low redshift analogs of high redshift first galaxies, and this is really an emerging uh, uh, interest uh, in the project at the moment that I think shows how beneficial the collaboration within Astro 3D can be with other projects, in particular with the first, uh, uh, with the uh, uh, Galaxy Evolution uh, team. And finally, there is also growing interest on the uh, connection between galaxies and the intergalactic medium. I won't talk much about this last point in my talk, but Uros talk next will be focused on this uh, third aspect of the research program. So in terms of the discovery of uh, 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 first uh, light sources, uh, we have been busy in the last few years uh, analyzing data from the brightest of reunizing galaxy survey carried out with uh, Hubble's wide field camera three, which is uh, a large area medium depth survey along random lines of sight uh, uh, in the sky. And uh, what we have been uh, finding with the uh, Borg is that we have a small but significant number of galaxies uh, that are uh, discovered uh, as photometric candidates at redshift greater than eight, so within the first 650 million years after the Big Bang, that are already brighter than our own galaxy at rest frame uh, uh, ultraviolet. So this. Uh, uh, galaxies uh, tell us uh, that star formation was already very efficient very early on and that these sources uh, had some contribution to cosmic uh, reunization. Now, 
uh, galaxies that we discover are photometric candidates uh, uh, from uh, uh, data at optical and near infrared wavelengths. You know, we then try to follow them up with uh, uh, Spitzer to get a rest frame optical view of these sources, uh, improve their photometric redshifts, and we have also an ongoing program to follow them up with spectroscopy, uh, primarily using Keck uh, MOSFAR. While the Borg survey has been primarily focused so far on finding first galaxies, recently we started looking whether uh, uh, relatively faint normal quasars, 25th magnitude uh, observed at JH wavelengths could be present inside the uh, data set and previously discarded because of their compact source uh, morphology, point source morphology. And very interestingly, we found one robust candidate with a photometric redshift of around eight, AD magnitude of 25th, so corresponding to an uh, absolute magnitude of minus 22nd. So, fairly fainter than the brightest quasars that are traditionally discovered beyond the redshift uh, 6. We have uh, uh, spitzer irak uh, data for this object uh, and uh, as an update to the, uh, this uh, figure that I showed at the uh, Astro 3D retreat uh, at the end of 2019 in January, we also had two nights of Keck MOS fire observations on the source. The weather was not great, uh, unfortunately, but still we have a very tentative uh, detection that we uh, are uh, uh, tentatively associating to Lyman alpha at redshift 7.6 with the spectrum shown here on the central lower uh, inset. And we have now submitted uh, proposals for further spectroscopic follow-up to confirm these very interesting faint quasars at uh, uh, the core of the epoch of uh, reunization. Um, Finding high redshift sources is only part uh, of uh, the work to understand how first galaxies uh, formed and evolved. It is crucial uh, uh, then to carry out uh, uh, accurate uh, source recovery simulations to understand what is our completeness uh, uh, in the observations uh, and what is our selection uh, function. And uh, 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 this uh, effort is currently uh, undertaken by a new Astro 3D postdoc in the first galaxies, team Nietzsche uh, Lito uh, uh, who is been developing a new code that uh, we are aiming to publicly release. And this is quite important because we are now entering uh, a, a moment uh, in the study of the first galaxies where we can go beyond the order of magnitude characterization of the abundance of these sources and really into an era of the precision luminosity function determination. Unfortunately, uh, details uh, very much matter when one carries out source recovery simulations. So Nietzsche is uh, uh, showing uh, uh, in the plot uh, uh, that I have here that depending on subtleties in how one implements uh, source recovery simulations, uh, uh, the recovered luminosity function can be quite different from the true input luminosity function that we are simulating uh, de uh, uh, depending on the uh, exact procedure uh, followed. So we are aiming to release soon a public robust code that will be very useful both for uh, analysis of current uh, Hubble data uh, surveys as well as for future James Webb and WFIRST uh, surveys. We are not just finding uh, uh, first light sources uh, uh, in the team, but we are also trying to model their uh, properties. And here I have some uh, uh, 
uh, interesting results from a recent paper by PhD student Kevin Wren uh, uh, in the uh, project just uh, published. And Kevin has been looking at the modeling of uh, first the galaxies uh, in the last couple of years. And in this most recent paper, he shifted his interest to modeling of uh, quasars and how they populate dark matter halos. And the aim of Kevin's paper is to show that uh, if one introduces scatter in the quasar luminosity versus uh, halo mass relation, uh, illustrated in the bottom central plot of this slide, then it is possible to naturally go from a Schechter-like halo mass function, which has an exponential suppression of the rarest, most massive halos, to a power, double power law for the quasar luminosity function, which has a greater abundance of bright rare objects, because these brightest quasars are not living in the rarest dark matter halos uh, as normal luminosity objects, but they are rather extreme outliers in terms of quasar efficiency in less massive uh, dark matter halos. And this prediction by uh, uh, Kevin has a very interesting uh, opportunity to be tested by recent measurements of the quasar clustering from Subaru hypersuprime camera observations. In fact, in Kevin's model, the uh, greater the uh, stochasticity in the quasar luminosity versus halo mass relation there is, the more closely aligned is the bias, when the, by bias I mean the clustering strength of quasars at different luminosities. So if we have a one-to-one -one relation between quasar uh, luminosity and halo mass, the, uh, the, the, the bias is very different at different luminosities, while the bias becomes closer together uh, 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 for the greater the scatter. And the data from the hypersuprine camera tell us that uh, indeed at least half a magnitude and more likely 0.75 magnitudes of scatters are needed to explain the observed uh, quasars uh, uh, clustering measurements. Um, briefly, another uh, uh, theoretical project that uh, we are working on is the study of the connection between uh, formation of long duration gamma ray bursts uh, in high redshift galaxies and chemical inhomogeneities uh, uh, in those uh, uh, sources. And uh, the study of uh, GRD host galaxies in this respect is giving us the opportunity to indirectly probe how metals are produced and uh, distributed inside galaxies and outside galaxies at high redshift. This is work that has been recently completed by Ben Mehta, a master's student at the University of Melbourne, who has nicely shown that supersolar host uh, galaxies for GRBs may have GRBs formed in low metallicity pockets. And Ben, with uh, 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 the model that he implemented over illustrious TNG uh, 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 galaxy, uh, uh, data has shown that we can get a good descriptions of the evolution uh, of both uh, absorption metallicities for GRD host galaxies and emission metallicities across uh, a quite broad range of uh, redshifts. As I mentioned, we are also looking quite closely at local galaxies, dwarf-like galaxies, to identify those that might tell us something about analogs at high redshift. And Alex Cameron, a PhD student at Melbourne, has in particular identified a very interesting galaxy in the SAMI survey in collaboration with the Galaxy Evolution team that has incredibly high signal to noise data for a variety of uh, metallicity lines, uh, in particular uh, aurora lines that allow a direct metallicity measurement. And Alex uh, in this paper in preparation is showing uh, 
that uh, depending on the uh, metallicity method used, one can get both a quite substantial spread in the measurement of the average metallicity, as well as very different answers in terms of metallicity gradients. Some lines give you flat gradients, some lines give you positive gradients, some lines give you negative gradients. So that's very interesting to set the high ratio of observations into proper context. Let me conclude very briefly with uh, 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 a few words on future outlooks. Uh, in the immediate term, we are quite busy as a team uh, focusing on further modeling and analysis of Hubble data. Uh, 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 Nietzsche is completing our source recovery completeness uh, tools uh, and plans then to apply it to high redshift luminosity function determinations from Hubble. Re uh, Kevin uh, Ren is moving uh, uh, on studying the uh, clustering of uh, uh, galaxies around bright quasars. Ben and Alex uh, are studying uh, GRB galaxy con uh, connection and related chemical uh, enrichment. If we take uh, a step further ahead in the medium term, we are really looking forward as a team uh, to go uh, uh, from galaxy counts with Hubble currently to detailed studies of those systems with the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, hopefully in 2022. Uh, the team is well positioned to access early data from uh, uh, the new uh, facility. Myself and Carl are members of the GLASS ERS uh, team, led by my longtime collaborator, Tommaso Treo at UCLA. We're also planning to use other ERS public data sets, such as the SEERS survey. And I'm also part of the guaranteed time observations that the Massimo Schiavelli at Space Telescope will carry out. And of course, we are preparing the cycle one JWST proposals, in particular focusing on what we can learn about the rest frame optical properties for the first galaxies with J, which JWST will show to an incredible level of details compared to the state of the art today, since Spitzer was giving us a, a very coarse view of the first galaxies. And finally, we'd like to highlight that uh, uh, we are also active on developing uh, uh, sovereign Australian capabilities for space uh, uh, telescopes, in particular the Skyhopper Space Telescope mission and vision to be flying around or after 2020-2024 for rapid follow-up of the GRB afterglows that would allow the study of star formation and the intergalactic medium during the epoch of realization as well as the cosmic infrared background measurements, which will constrain galaxy and agent formation across all redshifts. Skyhopper is also crucial to contribute to infrared exoplanet science, and overall would be quite an uh, interesting element for the next center of excellence, as it is well aligned to the space theme that has been highlighted as a growing area of interest in the midterm review of the decadal uh, plan that is currently uh, finishing. And I'm hoping to be able to share some news on space uh, uh, projects starting in the not too far uh, uh, future. Uh, so here are my conclusions. I think first galaxy science is at the current and future frontier. And uh, we have uh, uh, quite uh, a number of investigations, uh, good outlook, and I'm looking forward to collaborations uh, with other uh, projects uh, which have been proven particularly fruitful uh, in the last uh, few years. So thank you very much. Thank you, and, uh, Michaela. Oh, please. So I have a, I have a question from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, V on what drives such a big difference in the recover the luminosity function at the right hand. Well, that uh, first let me clarify that that was uh, a test luminosity function with a simple power law. But what, uh, what drives that big difference is uh, 
the, uh, uh, how one treats a photometric scatter in the source recovery simulations, and primarily whether one simulates uh, the true luminosity function, the shatter form, uh, uh, or in the case uh, that I've shown for the ideal case, the uh, power law form of the luminosity function, which requires uh, quite a bit of attention in setting up the Monte Carlo uh, uh, simulations because the bright objects are very rare, or if one assumes a flat luminosity function and then uh, does some manipulation to try to rescale the flat luminosity function uh, 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 source recovery simulation to the true luminosity function. And uh, uh, hopefully Nietzsche's paper, which is being finalized now, uh, will uh, make some clarity in the field. Uh, and I think uh, having a public tool will also greatly help because so far every team has developed their own tools, not even fully described in the papers. All right, thank you, Michaela. There was one comment from Lisa as well in the chat. She says that some but not all of those metallicity diagnostics are very sensitive to ionization parameter and other properties, which contribute to differences in parent gradients. Yes. Could you comment on that, please? I think uh, this is a this is a this is a, a, a great comment, and uh, uh, indeed uh, we are uh, uh, we are working. Alex, uh, to be more precise, Alex, Alex is working with Lisa and her team uh, to try to model that source, uh, and uh, uh, in the future we're planning to extend it uh, to a broader set of local analogs. So hopefully we'll we'll be able to to give a bit more guidance about. Uh, the robustness of some of the high redshift results uh, that are uh, 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 being seen for metallistic gradients. <laughs>